Physicians in general, and uh, patients in particular, like to look at disease conditions as being totally and separate and apart from each other. For instance, as a community, we suffer from some of the highest incidences of coronary artery disease. But is coronary artery disease an isolated event? No, it's not. Is it an isolated disease process? It's not. It's a conglomeration of symptoms as a result of underlying diseases. So a lot of times in patient and cognitive my private practice in Richmond Hill, I spend quite a bit of time trying to explain to patients that that little blood pressure, that little high cholesterol, that little diabetes, all in time will become big cholesterol, big diabetes, big hypertension, big heart disease, big stroke. And this is how we should look at disease processes as it, as it affects us. In the past, I've given a few talks on isolated disease processes and how to actually go through the etiology, the clinical aspects, the pathogenesis, how the disease is formed, the clinical aspects, how it manifests itself in the patient, and the complications if it were not to be treated. When we think of these disease processes, then we should try and understand what is the end organ effect if all of these diseases were not kept in check, or what ultimately can we expect as a result of not paying attention to the advice giving us, given to us by healthcare personnel in the pursuit of trying to control our hypertension, our diabetes, our high cholesterol, and hence preventing early onset or premature onset of coronary artery disease, renal disease, eye changes. Because my advice is after being in the practice of medicine in the field for 25 plus years, practicing close to six to seven days per week of over 14 hours per day, I'm thankful to God for one thing, is the ability to have done that and to have actually seen patients and seen the manifestation of disease processes as a clinician, not from reading books. And over my last 20 years in Richmond Hill, I've seen a lot of pathology associated with our people in terms of the way the diseases affect them, the way they actually approach disease processes, sometimes initially as if it's anti-medicine. Oh, this is going to still happen to me, regardless or not if I take medications. Or, doctor, you're only doing this test because it's important that you do it. It's not for me. Or, he's just telling you this to make you scare. I've never ever in uh, my experience as a physician actually hear a physician tell a patient something to the detriment of that patient in order to benefit whether financially or otherwise. I've always seen it on the, on the other side of it where patients haven't been advised, ignored it because obviously they have other things to do or did not feel it important enough to follow the advice of the clinician and hence ended up in premature um, disease process that could have been prevented. Point in question is a young woman I saw about a year ago, 26 years old, who was advised that a shortness of breath was not related to the bronchitis that she was having, but may have been something much more sinister and underlying based on the fact that she was on a pill that could actually predispose her to the formation of clot within her veins. Lo and behold, I was not prophetic in telling her what was going to be the reason for her demise. It just, I was not happy that a shortness of breath was as a result of or underlying bronchitic symptoms, which are quite common, especially in the winter months. It turned out that she had a showering emboli. She had a deep vein thrombosis, was an obese young woman with a hypercoagulable state, not very different from most of the persons that I would see in my practice to say that she is different and that she's predisposed to this disease. It just happened that she developed a clot in the veins that clot in the veins and the deep veins propagated to the lungs, caused a showering emboli, and she eventually died on the BQ scan table, which increasing shortness of breath and hemoptysis, very, very like symptoms that we would get with a bronchitis or even an, up, an upper respiratory tract infection. These are the life-threatening conditions that we sometimes see in private practice. The charts behind me is just a reflection of some of the disease processes that I will tend to put together over the next six to seven lectures in terms of explaining to you 
why it is so important to listen. In uh, the practice of medicine, not everything or nothing is black and white. It's always shades of gray. And it sometimes depends on the clinician who is able to see beyond the shades of gray to actually dogmatically explain to patient, as I did a couple, two Saturdays ago, with a young man coming in with a heart rate for the first time of 106 beats per minute. He was 35 years old, who had had a cardiac event and was actually in bed thinking that he didn't feel well because of the flu and in, did in fact have advanced coronary artery disease. And in fact, at this point in time, had a coronary artery bypass graft for quadruple vessel disease on Sunday. So it's not very uncommon for us to see disease processes. What I like about the community per se and the way in which the education of medicine has gone is that most persons now pay a little bit more attention, or I would say, safely say, a lot more attention to their disease processes. And when they go to funeral homes, they place it as a point of reference as to what that person was, who they were, and what they died for, from. When I used to go to uh, funeral homes for relatives and friends, I would hear discussions based on the, the niceness of the person, how much they had contributed in life, and how much their family will miss them. Now I hear it. What are the disease processes that cause the untimely demise of that individual? And if so, how can they prevent it in their own family? I do not know if this is because I'm a physician in the community that I'm told about this, but I hope that this is not, I am not the point of reference here, but that the education level in our community regarding the common disease processes are regarded probably in a better light, that if we do not look after ourselves, it doesn't matter what the quality or the caliber of the physician or the advice given to you by the broader, spe broader spectrum of the media is going to do for you unless you care for your very self. Let us consider the charts behind us and try and figure how these disease processes, all encompassing as individual diseases, but they affect the end organs and the pathology of it and the pathogenesis as the degree, as the degree, disease progresses, how does it affect us? All of us would have heard about diabetes mellitus, obviously sugar in the blood. Um, basically, diabetes just means the increased passage of urine, but based on the increased mellitus is based on the increased amount of sugar. And all of us know of the common presentation of diabetes polyuria, I want to go to the bathroom frequently to pass urine, polyphagia, I want to eat repeatedly, Poly, um, polydipsia, I always feel thirsty, the weight loss, the fatigue, the malaise that comes about with recent onset of diabetes or diabetes not totally controlled. We all know it as a disease process in which we have a relative insufficiency of insulin. A lot of times our patients come to us and say, doctor, do I have type 1 diabetes? Do I have type 2 bi diabetes? I know when I was in medical school, being type 1 and type 2 diabetes meant something. Now what it means to us is basically in our community, 10% of our population is type 1 diabetes, meaning for some unfortunate event, whether it be an autoimmune disease, we develop antibodies against our pancreas and we stop producing the insulin. Now we are unable to take those glucose molecules which the insulin actually trap and get into the cells. Not only does it serve for us as a source of nutrient to the cells, to the mitochondria of the cells, that source of nutrient is meant to drive the energy cycle of the cell to produce something called ATP, which is used for production of energy. That production of energy, the sugar that's needed for that, is what gives us the energy in the microscopic level to work out, to think. It gives the brain enough water in terms of the cytoplasm so it functions well. It's the energy from the ATP molecules that give us the energy plus the other cytoplasmic function. And you're looking at this at a microscopic level. Just imagine you've got a billion of cells. But this particular process takes place in each of those individual cells because remember what your circulatory system is. It's the heart, 
the major blood vessels, then the smaller blood vessels, then the capillary levels. If you've ever seen the big diagrams with all small, um, smaller vessels towards the periphery, but every cell in your body and the billions of cells within your body need that energy source. And if it were not for the insulin, we would not be able to take that energy source into the cells itself. In addition to the fact, think about what it does to you. In a diabetic who is just about to get into coma, they're confused, they're distracted, and then they get into coma. But we go through a transition of high sugar levels. Let's say, for instance, when we're hypoglycemic, with a blood sugar level less than 50. When we check our blood sugar, it's 50. We're not getting any insulin, any sugar to our cells just because the sugar level is low. In the case in which the blood sugar level is over 180 to 200, and the etiology of it is basically a relative insufficiency of insulin. In that particular person's case, there's no energy. So the brain itself shuts down. We start to feel confused. We cannot focus. We all tend to be confused, and we tend to be disorganized. The mouth is dry. All the cells are dry within the mouth. We feel it when we want to speak because there's no saliva. The tongue feels heavy. The eyes feel dry. You feel the tiredness and fatigue within your body because the cells at a microscopic level are not functioning. The same applies to the heart. The same applies to the rest of the organs within the digestive system. We, when the blood sugar level is high and the sugar is not getting into the cells, every single organ system, whether it be the central nervous system, the head, nose, neck, ear, nose, and throat, the pulmonary system, we start to feel tiredness, and difficulty breathing. The muscles of the diaphragm become tired easily. We can't even work out because we can't even breathe properly because we cannot even get our intercostal muscles to start pushing the amount of air that we need from the relative exercise, the increased exercise that we're doing. The same thing happens to the muscles. They have no strength. They have no ability because they are not functioning at a microscopic level. So that lack of insulin is resulting not in an increased blood sugar level in an isolated fashion, but look at how it affects your central nervous system, the way you think. Your head, neck, ear, nose, ear, nose and throat, your digestive system is affected. You're faced with issues to do with inability, either relative constipation or diarrhea or both, and intermittently. You're faced with not feeling well and all you want to do is to lie on a couch and be there. The issue with diabetes per se from a perspective as a patient, is not look upon it as the sugar level being high or whether I have type 1 and type 2. I was on to the topic of explaining to you the difference between type 1 and type 2. But here is where the transition in practice takes place. In medical school, I used to think of type 1 as lack of insulin, and that is that unfortunate young person under the age of 20 who just developed an autoimmune disease and doesn't produce insulin any longer. The majority of cases, however, are to do with non-insulin dependent diabetes where there's a relative insufficiency of insulin. By that I mean that you you either your glucose intake is way in excess of your energy requirements for the day. And hence you have, you're not burning the calories, you're not burning the sugar, so now that sugar levels remain high in the blood. That's the increased load that you put on yourself by the increased amount of food that you eat. And in our community, it has to do with the fact of the kinds of food we eat. In addition to that, we, our, our love for starches, our love, love for rice, roti, and uh, sweet meats, etc., the par, the, the, beer, um, the pears, etc., and the parasite, etc. All of this is high sugar content. It's sugar water getting into the blood. Now, you're asking us, especially when we put on an extra weight, our BMI in excess of 25, and basically we we're short stature, we put on a lot of weight, we have a lot of fat cells which don't burn um, energy as well, and we face with that relative insufficient insulin where the quantum of insulin we produce is not enough to bring down that sugar level. And hence the sugar level remains high. And in our next discussion, I will tell you how it impacts on the rest of the bodies and the functions of the kidneys and the heart itself. Continuing on the impact of diabetes and heart disease and uh, kidney disease, eye disease, etc., is to try and figure in terms of bringing it all together how these dif different diseases and our patients, we tend to regard them and suffer with them 
and knowing the what is it that really the physician is doing and looking for that makes you feel as if you're on the same page with the physician in terms of his thought process and yours. And sometimes it's not easy to accomplish all of this during the course of a patient visit, especially with so many things to discuss with that patient's referrals, etc., cetera, um, reports, etc. But coming back to the disease of the difference between a type 1 and type 2 diabe diabetic, and as I said, with the evolution of time in the practice of medicine, I've noticed that the majority of our patients, maybe not even 90% that's quoted in the textbook, as being a non-insulin dependent diabetic. It's about probably close to 95 to 98 percent that I see. Probably one or two percent of my practice with a large diabetic population is that of being a juvenile diabetic or type 1 diabetes. However, that is not to say that basically there's some patients out there. And here's how we go through the transition. And this is what is alarming to me as a clinician, is that I'm finding newer and newer cases and earlier and earlier presentation of diabetes in our young, uh, young children. I'm talking about the teenagers at the ages of 14 with a hemoglobin A1C of closer to 6. The average hemoglobin A1C, which is what the blood sugar level has been over the last three months when it is targeted against the hemoglobin, the lifespan of a hemoglobin molecule, which primary objective is to carry oxygen. But a secondary effect of it is also it labels and tags glycosylated hemoglobin, label and tags a sugar molecule. So we are able to tell over the last three months, not the fasting blood sugar level, the hemoglobin A1C is able to say for the last three months what the blood sugar level. And I've been doing it on my patients, especially the ones, the younger individuals in the practice between the ages of, say, between 12 and 18, school kids who I've noticed are becoming increasingly obese, lack of exercise, probably spend more time with the video games or the, or the computers, and then coming with this truncal fat that I'm seeing. Lo and behold, you do the hemoglobin A1C, and you find that it's elevated. And this is my concern at this stage. These are the same individuals, and it's an increasing amount of new onset diabetes. They are at this stage producing insulin but they come from families. So the genetic propensity for the production of insulin has been decreased, especially if both parents are diabetics. It means that the quantum of insulin being produced by that individual is less. What makes it worse for us as a community is because of the intermarriage within a small gene pool, that gene for the production of insulin is already decreased. So when that child inherits a gene from both parents, then they have even a greater propensity for the production of insulin. Add that now to that young person who decides that, whoa, it's better to eat pizza. It's better to eat the fast foods, fast foods. I like my, I cannot drink water alone, I need a soda. They pump their bodies with an increasing amount of sugar water per day, and I do not care how you classify sugar water. Sugar water is a very common Caribbean term for drinking sodas and sweetened drinks. But we do the same thing when we decide to, drink, to take a, um, a roti, a plate of rice, instead of a scoop of rice, we take a plate. Instead of taking one roti, we take a very large roti. In my days, rotis used to be the size of this. Now they're the size of this. A plate of rice used to be this, now it's the size of this. Now one person doesn't eat a pizza any, a slice of pizza anymore, they eat several slices of pizza. The games are on, we sit in front of the TV, we do not exercise. So how is life different among our parents and grandparents than it is for us today is a question they ask. The issue is very simple. Back in the Caribbean, back in the, 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 the tropical climates, you're outdoors. Most of the time you spend exercising or doing manual work. The amount of carbohydrates you eat is, use, is used up by the end of the day. There's very little electrical supply, electricity that serves throughout the entire, the entire night, so lights go off early. Eating time is earlier. Rising time is earlier. So our level of metabolism is based on increased physical activity, decreasing amount of food consumption, increasing amount of time spent actively pursuing either living or playing sports. 
Those are the things that make a difference. By playing sports, we utilize all the glucose molecules, the glucose that we intake. There may not have been as much of carbohydrates in terms of being available, in terms of the fast foods that are cheap carbohydrate sugar loads that are so readily and easily accessible in this community, in our community in the United States. It's the cheap foods that make us put on this weight because of a simple fact it's easy to get, it's easy to consume, and there's a pressure and a demand for us to involve ourselves and to snack on everything that's shown in front of us. That is probably, in my estimation, one of the re reasons why genetically we predisposed to it, environmentally we've now accepted it as the norm that we should pick and eat on everything that's thrown in front of us and not accept the consequence of our action when we start to become obese as a young individual and now putting on excessive amount of weight, not exercising, decreased muscle mass, and hence our incidence of diabetes will just continue to rise. Those are the reality of practice today. So now let us consider what diabetes does to us. As teenagers, you develop diabetes quite young. You have a longer duration of time in your life to be affected by the disease process. Our goal in life of if we are from diabetic parents, and I am not saying this from a distance because my parents were diabetic as well, but our goal in life is to make sure that the onset of treatment of our diabetes starts at a later and later stage in life. So whatever you can do at this stage is to make sure if you're a young individual with a hemoglobin A1C that's high, work on your weight, work on your eating habits, work on your exercise, work on decreasing that amount of time you spend in sedentary existence when it doesn't seem to matter. It is not part of your schoolwork or part of your education process. Why spend and waste the time just clicking away on cell phones or on, or on, um, on computers when it doesn't seem to matter to you anywhere? Try and get involved with your health from the standpoint of decreasing your weight, increasing your exercise. You will feel so much better for it. You will find that your, 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 your zest for life increases. The less the weight is, the more this weight is on you, whether it be the trunk of fat and the fat of the fact, the distribution of, of the obesity around the, the mammary areas or around the waist areas, the pants itself falls to the bottom, the belly overhangs. It's a disgusting feeling at best. Work on it to get it to that level where you understand what you're doing is for your benefit. It's not that sugar level today. If you become diabetic at the age of 20, then you can bet your bottom dollar. By the time you reach 40 to 50, you are a statistic for advanced coronary artery disease, for eye changes, diabetic eye changes. Let's go through coronary artery disease. You will get either stent implant by the time you're 40, especially if that sugar is not being controlled. You will have evidence of, of sexual dysfunction as a male, you will start to have a peripheral vascular disease where you start to feel tiredness in the leg and you cannot walk a particular distance. You also find increased amount of ulcers on your finger by burning your cells because of the diabetic neuropathy. You also find early changes associated with kidney changes with protein passed in the urine, developing hypertension at an earlier age, and also suffering from chronic renal failure, needing dialysis after about 20 to 30 years of being diabetic. Worst of all, you can precipitate that whole process by not even trying to control your sugar. And we could be a statistic for the morgue in less than 10, 15 to 20 years as a young person. So it's not that you're saying go to Dr. Baldeo for treatment. It is basically go to your physician and make sure that your physician takes care of that with you in an educational, in an educational environment to explain to you why is it so important that you be the one to make sure your sugar level goes down and how you can make it. What I do in my practice is to make sure I give you a sheet. Show me what your fasting blood sugar levels have been over the last two weeks before you come back, before I decide I'm going to put your medication. Let me see what your weight has been. What is your weight change? What is your level of activity? Guidance, nutritional counseling, exercise management should be all part of what we should offer our diabetics. 
Lo and behold, not everything in life is equal. Insurance companies do not think diabetic education is something that important. Why? Because they do not have the high incidence that we have in our community. Physicians, as I come as myself, are constantly advocating for the need for this in our community, and I hopefully, I hope that in the future we probably can be able to get that and be able to offer it to our, peer, uh, to our patients. When we look at this diagram, we can have a pictorial representation of what are some of the changes that we expect of our diabetic population. And I'm talking about the ones, especially our elder, the, the younger, the, the middle-aged, and the older ones whose blood sugar gets high. But this is the same picture that applies to the young individual. My, con my, my, my discourse a couple of minutes ago with the young individuals does not separate from the old individuals who figure that they could engage in the same activities of eating and lack of exercise as they did 10 to 15 years ago before they were diagnosed as being diabetic. Because here again, it is to try and get the best quality of your life. And to, un to understand what your quality of your life is, is to understand if I were not to control my diabetes or my disease process, then what would the outcome of my life be? What would I expect? And most of us, if I mention a particular set of terms, will understand, yes, I did have a relative who was diabetic. They had an amputation. Wow, they had a little sore in the foot. They did not even know that they had a puncture wound. And now that individual has developed an ulcer. And what tends to happen? Oh, they developed the ulcer the sole of the foot. Then they had an amputation of the toe. Then they had an amputation of the ample ankle. Then they had an amputation of the knee. And you know what? They ended up with this, and this was a terminal event. And that's how we describe it. Or the young individual who basically had the stroke. That person was well, then got a stroke, but recovered fully. But you know fully well, haven't got that first stroke. Whether it be an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke, it basically has to do with all for us. It's the pathology that matters. You get one stroke, you're a figment of who you are before. Not only do you have the motor deficit that goes with it, I can't move my hands as much, I can't move it as fast, I can't write as freely as I do, but you also go through the thought process where I have to think, I have to think a lot before I can even focus. I am not, I sometimes have phase that I'm asking questions to patients who've had stroke, and I'm not saying, I'm talking about young individuals under the age of 50, and you ask them to focus, and they're looking at you, the eyes are wide open, but you know this is not the individual you had as a patient prior to him having the stroke. You as individuals in your home will find that your parent haven't had a stroke. They're distant. They sometimes are, the eyes are just glaring like that. They're not able to focus. Those are some of the multi, the, the small lacuna infarcts that you get in the brain that no one tends to notice. And over time, it gets worse and worse. Our hope is that we prevent these things. We try and prevent the brain changes. We try and prevent the eye changes, which I'll go into next, the heart changes, the changes that are going with the liver, the changes with the gastrointestinal system, the changes to do with erectile dysfunction, the changes to do with the musculoskeletal system, the changes to do with the general sensorium of a diabetic patient. It's to do with the mindset of that individual who is a diabetic. When they get up, they get up malaise, lethargic. I can't focus for the rest of the day. Prior to becoming diabetic, that person was vigilant, excited, ready to rock and roll from the time they get up. Now we're faced with situations where we have to accept a subnormal lifestyle of both intellect and physical ability. Why? Because we choose not to listen to advice given. When we talk about diabetes and the brain changes that take place, a lot of our patients are under the misconception that basically the stroke is just as a result of the high blood pressure. Strokes can be two types, whether ischemic or hemorrhagic. Ischemic means that there's a decrease in blood supply to the brain. What is the blood supply to the brain? We all know this is the heart, this is the aorta, this is the brachiocephalic, the common carotid, and the subclavian arteries, the biggest arteries that goes to the brain via the internal carotid, the common carotid bifurcates into the internal and the external carotid. The internal carotid supplies the brain stem and basically gives the blood supply to the, to the brain itself. In addition to that, the vertebral artery supplies the, 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 vertebral, the spinal cord. 
for the majority of the blood supply comes from the carotid arteries. Now, we think of blood pressure as being just a view. How do you get a stroke? You get a stroke from a decrease in the blood supply to this nice structure, which is for us the, probably the greatest gift that God has given us, is the ability to think, the ability to take ourselves from one, per, one, one, one point in time to the next through our thought processes. Maybe some of us have extra gifts in physical abilities, etc. But I think the majority of us will agree that if it were not for the function of the brain, we will not be here at this point in time. We have to owe it to ourselves that this is what we need to protect. The heart, obviously, we need it in order to function. But without the brain, I guess we are basically useless. Whether that, that, that stroke be an ischemic or an hemorrhagic stroke, you will damage the brain. Ischemia, decrease in blood supply to the brain, you cause an infarct because there is no oxygen going to the brain. So what happens at that point in time is that the brain, that portion of the brain dies. A hemorrhagic stroke is when a blood vessel ruptures, whether through an aneurysm, an abnormal dilatation of that blood vessel, or the weakening of, of it through to an atherosclerosis plaque. That can result in a hemorrhagic stroke, much difficult to resolve. We do a CAT scan with contrast, and we find hemorrhagic versus ischemic. To you, the patient, it is of little academic significance. That's all it is for you, because at the end of it, what it happens to us, we're not the same individuals we used to be in terms of motor skill and in terms of how we think. Now we're saying to ourselves, oh, it's not my blood pressure alone, but think about it. Every facet of the blood supply that goes to the brain itself is a function of how much we do in life to protect the integrity of that blood vessel. And this blood vessel to the brain is the same blood vessel that goes to the heart itself. It's the same blood vessel that goes to the periphery. It's the same blood vessel that goes to the kidney. So when we think about our disease process, if we know the end organ, that's how we think about how we should approach life. We've got the high blood pressure. We know we can probably have a higher risk of getting a stroke, but so also can we get a higher risk of getting worsening blood pressure and renal disease and eye changes based on hypertensive retinopathy. When you get the exudates at the back of the eye, you get the little aneurysms, dilatations at the back of the eye. We get the loss of vision. So from here, showing you what the complications of, whether it be the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, the diabetes, dietary habits, the genetic propensity for it, it affects us the same way. The brain itself is get, gets damaged. But in our community, we don't, ha we don't suffer with just one of it. We like to do things in, in, in greater quantums than most persons. We tend to suffer with high blood pressure. We have the high cholesterol as well. Control the high cholesterol because it is this high cholesterol that is going to form especially with the total HDL, the good form of cholesterol not protecting us, and the HDL being high, and also a little excess of alcohol that gets the triglyceride up, and also excessive amount of carbohydrate that gets the same carbohydrate load that we're going to be using to increase our sugar level, to make our diabetes worsen, is also going to increase our triglyceride, going to be part of the syndrome, which I'll try and discuss in a short, in a short while, that causes us to, pre to form... Um, premature atheromatous plaques. And this is how simple it is to form. You get the bad cholesterol coming in, you get the hypertension that causes arteriolar spasm, so you have an abnormally, which is supposed to be a normal blood vessel, now goes into spasm. You also have the irritation. The same factors that cause these, this disease process to worsen. Then you form that little elevated LDL with an accumulation Believe the endo, be, uh, beneath the endothelium, then you get the narrowing of the endothelium, what then we have is a big plaque. Now this same plaque within the brain itself, within the carotid arteries, can form an emboli. It can dislodge, form an emboli, blocks the blood vessel, we get an ischemic stroke. This can also cause weakening of the walls itself of the same cerebral artery, resulting in rupture. We get a hemorrhagic stroke. Think about the whole process of our diseases, that it affects the blood vessels. And by and large, without the blood vessel, the human beings should be thought of as flesh sustained by blood vessels. And it doesn't have to be 
It's a blood vessel that starts with the heart, going off to the major um, arterial system, but then it's a microvascular disease, as diabetes is. As for all the end organs that tend to be affected by the process of our combined disease processes that we suffer with as a community, is basically to recognize that it's not the single entity per se. It's not the stroke that you had for the hypertension. It's the conglomeration of the symptoms of the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, and the fact when they act collectively, the impact is much worse. And sometimes for no reason of our own, whatever it is that we are supposed to be getting either genetically or environmentally as disease processes, we accept them, but we move beyond them. How now can I impact on this disease process? to make sure that I have the longest, healthiest existence that I possibly can have. And that can only come from an education of knowing if I were not to treat it, what would happen. For instance, we all know very well, if I go through a red light, I can get away with it. If there's no camera and if there's no cop nearby. But if I go through a red light and a cop is there, then I get ticketed. But I go through a red light and I slam it to someone's car and end up costing them their lives. We know the impact it will have. The same analogy applies here. Ignore what you have. You might get away with it for a while. You might do it as often as you can. You may not end up dying from it at the same time. But you will at least be in a position to, to decrease your life expectancy if you so ignore some of the warning signs. This diagram will give us um, a better impact of what if you were to isolate just hypertensive changes. Throughout the lectures, I've been trying to tell you how it is that the different diseases tend to affect us. And let's just focus a little while what does high blood pressure per se does to us, and then we'll see what high cholesterol does to us, us, and then what diabetes does to us as disease processes as we try and conclude on those lectures to do with the combined effect on our organs itself. This is the heart of a, of a hypertensive patient. And if you probably will be able to recognize that this is an enlarged heart, when you look at it on an either an x-ray, it looks as if it has left ventricular hypertrophy or the bulging of this. But definitively on, a, on an echocardiogram, you will see evidence of an enlarged heart with a decreased ejection fraction or the amount of blood being pumped out of it. But more, more prominent you'll find is left ventricular hypertrophy. What that means is that the left ventricle itself pumping against an increasing resistance as any muscle would hypertrophies or gets bigger. The walls becomes thicker. When the walls becomes thicker, it decreases the lumen of the left ventricle. It also decreases the amount of blood being coming out of it. It also makes an increasing demand on the oxygen that's coming from the coronary artery. When you start to have that and the decrease in blood supply, you will, get a you will get muscles, myocardial muscles, that actually undergo necrosis. When it undergoes necrosis, then basically some of it will die. Then instead of having this irritable heart that has to pump against an increasing resistance, we now have a heart that now refuses because it cannot no longer, it cannot sustain the increasing resist, the increasing strength it needs. It's hypertrophy, the walls have gotten thicker, and the blood supply is decreased because obviously the blood supply will no longer be able to sustain an increasing thickness of the muscles or the amount of cells demanded of it. But also in addition to that, we develop additional pathology involving the blood supply from the coronary artery, and we can see where there's even evidence of blocked coronary artery. So a blocked coronary artery, and if it happens at a proximal level, just imagine what happens to the blood supply here. The same thing happens now this blood, this muscle itself, now the heart itself can become a nice structure that used to function well, hypertrophy now becomes thin and floppy and then beats like this and then we go into congestive heart failure over a period of time. The same pathology that causes high blood pressure can cause arteriolar spasm in the coronary arteries and decrease the blood supply. All we need is two or three episodes of vasospasms and we can get a coronary event, whether it be a heart attack, um, a heart attack that can give us just a portion of the heart being affected or a massive heart attack that results in sudden death. The damage to the heart itself, as we see here, 
is both at a coronary artery level and a myocardial level. What we look at in terms of what happens to the brain, as we mentioned in the previous discussion, this is the most common area of the brain that actually ruptures in hypertensive is a descending lenticulate striatal branch of the middle cerebral artery. And we can see when, it, when that happens, the reason I'm telling you this is because that's the one that results in the stroke. The person having um, a stroke with a paresis on one side, a paralysis on one side, or a paresis because it involves the motor cortex of the brain. And that is the one that's supplied by the internal capsule and the descending lenticular striatal branch of the middle cerebral artery is the one that's most notorious for undergoing um, hemorrhagic um, rupture of the, um, of the blood vessels. But remember, we have patients who have ruptures of the circle of Willis can result in brainstem, injury, brainstem damage. They go into a coma, sudden death, and die. Or even just get a small hemorrhage, a pontine hemorrhage, resulting in blocking out the respiratory center and causing sudden death. The pressure within the brain from building up from the bleeding can cause coning and can also cause sudden death as a result. So stroke in itself might be one of the events. Sudden death is the other event. Being recovered from a complete stroke and having a less of a pers um, less of a personality or personality changes is some of the subtle effects we find in chronic hypertensive with small lacuna infarcts without getting that big stroke yet when they get the big stroke that everyone realizes the changes in those individuals. But we can look at our relatives with stroke and see what the cerebral changes are. We also mentioned that there are some retinal changes. What are those changes that take the person to the ophthalmologist and say, well, I'm seeing some floaters in my eyes, or I'm not seeing as clear as I used to see before. Does hypertension, does hypertension predispose you to, to retinal disease? Yes, it does. It causes exudates at the back of the eye, and also retinal changes in terms of exudates, whether it be from the blood that floats at the back of the eye. And sometimes you find these little floaters in the hypertension. They tell you, you've got to send them to the ophthalmologist. We all think that laser is a cure and a remedy for everything. No, it's not. You get one laser treatment, you're going to bet your bottom dollar you're going to be going back for another laser treatment. Because basically it is to prevent the disease process. That's what we're here for. If we prevent the high blood pressure by taking our medications, decrease the risk factors that caused us to develop it in the first place, whether it be our increased salt consumption or our bad dietary habits or lack of exercise or obesity, that's what contributed to this. Or the comorbid conditions that we've had that we allow to go on progress. We allow to go um, on progress and basically we refuse to listen to advice given. What are some of the kidney changes that takes place? Obviously, in, di in hypertensive, much more common to have renal artery stenosis. But there's also damage that takes place not only to the, the big blood vessel, renal, the renal artery that goes to it, but also small blood vessels within the kidney. Remember, the kidney is just this organ that has this profuse amount of blood going into it at the capillary level and undergoes filtration. So what does, what does, diabetes, what does hypertension do? It damages both the renal arterial flow into the kidney and also the glomerulus that filters the kidney. So you get a double whammy now where the blood is pushing in, but it's not coming at the force it should become, so it's not filtering as much as it should be doing. But then also the, 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 the glomerulus that's supposed to filter the blood to transform it into urine refuses to take the blood. And hence we get, not only do we get a situation where we damage our kidneys, but damaging the kidney exacerbates your blood pressure. Now your blood pressure is much more difficult to control. Hence it's important to control the initial event so that you're not faced with complications from both ends. That in a synopsis is what high blood pressure does to the major organs. And there are other organs it affects, but these are primarily the ones. Does taking medication... Um, causes severe sexual dysfunction in the males. No, it's, it's, most of the medications today are quite safe in terms of that, and most of them are uh, catered towards protecting the kidneys, whether it be ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, etc. So we should be asking our doctors for advice based on those. Most of us, as we advance in age, would like to have a picture similar to this guy. Um, Jovial-looking fella, not the receding hairline, which I will add to. But the mere fact that this is the kind of picture that looks nice and acceptable to us as a society, and I'm talking about the society that I grew up in, 
where fatness and nice, now fatness equates niceness. A child was nice because they were wrong and fat. The skinny child was not healthy. Same applies to the adults. You look rosy and red and you look very plump and healthy. That is an antithesis to our existence at this stage of the game. When we present with a picture of this gentleman feeling fat and jovial, I like his style, I like how he looks. But what he has done for himself by that strong amount of fat, he has actually decreased his life expectancy. By, in, this, in this gentleman's case, it is a combined effect of the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the especially increasing triglyceride, the high blood pressure, the abnormal cholesterol, meaning the good form of cholesterol is low, the bad form of cholesterol is high, the triglyceride is high. You've actually combined this to call to get into metabolic syndrome. What are the other entities that we accept as a society that predispose us to this? We accept fatness and niceness. When the waist circumference of a man is over 44, or in the case of a woman, is over 35, there's an increased risk of development of premature coronary artery disease as a result of metabolic syndrome. But it's not only the artery disease, the coronary artery disease, it's also the other changes that takes place in the rest of the bodily functions as we develop the complications that I alluded to earlier. The ones to do with the damages to the eyes, to the kidneys, and to the rest of the musculoskeletal system. In addition to that, add the morbidity associated with aches and pains and a number of hours are lost from work. The early degenerative changes that we actually make our knees and our hips go through to the point we have to retire early. We have an existence where we can just not afford to find the next chair to sit on. Where that exercise we used to be able to do, we can no longer do it. Well, stick it to a friend with a metabolic syndrome. Just imagine if this was a cycle of an event that took place at a time when our blood vessels were nice and good. This gentleman, by his own making, and also by the genetic propensity that he had for the development of high cholesterol, diabetes, hypertension, and the fact that he's combined it with his morbidity, and he or she replaces it with a female face, it's the same thing. And it's not just that a simple fact, the combined effect is called metabolic syndrome. And what this now does to you, it precipitates each of those little events that would have taken 10 to 15 years before you have an end organ damage to precipitate it within three to four years. You will start to find the effects of it, especially if it's not being controlled. The blood vessels as it is was very nice. Patent, the lumen open, blood flows freely. Now we've added to this the diabetes. Now instead of having the sugar molecules tagged with insulin and getting out to the cells, no. Our blood becomes hypervis um, much more viscous. We develop hyperviscosity syndrome, platelets stickiness, endothelial irritation. The high blood pressure now damages the endothelial alignment and causes arterial spasm within the smooth muscles of the arteries. That combined with the fact now our high cholesterol comes into play. It now produces these irritable looking um, um, cholesterol molecules that does not protect the endothelial lining anymore. And what it does, it makes it a focus of now the formation of atheromatous plaques. And these plaques are a combination of irritants in the blood. There are no antioxidants around. There's an increased amount of, 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 of free radicals. There's an increased amount of platelet stickiness. So it's a prime area for cholesterol molecules to form and an increased amount of cholesterol plus the stickiness created by the hyperviscosity of the blood from the diabetes now results in us forming a nice plaque. That plaque can do two things. It's a soft plaque or a hard plaque. A soft plaque adds more material into it and causes damages or narrowing to that vessel. This is the same blood vessel that is going to damage our brain to give us a stroke. That's going to damage our heart to give us that heart attack. That's going to damage our kidneys. That is going to give us that, that renal failure. That's going to damage the rest of our musculoskeletal system. Give us a decrease in blood supply. We have a little energy. We're faced with an issue where we don't feel like exercise. So now it's a great cyclical event of lack of exercise, no muscle mass, no way of burning out the, 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 the sugar molecules, no way of actually increasing our muscle mass so it becomes much more effective. What we left with as this gentleman is a big trunk of water fat. And we always say in our community as itself, 
you're fat and nice mean you're healthy or your belly is getting big you're getting more money or basically you're nice and rested I think you're being wealthy no this is our burden the fat around the trunk of fat is our burden this is where the cortisol is going to be produced this is where the insulin resistance is going to develop this is where we're going to feel that lack of of conviction about ourselves that we don't need to go there and exercise and it's probably one of the worst things to develop our first task should be try to get back to our ideal weight for high if you do nothing else for yourself get back to that weight that you had when you were in your twenties when you were so active you had so much energy you felt so full of life if you can get back to that as the biggest single change to make in order to get back your life What I would like you to remember at the end of this discussion is a diagram that shows what this is, understanding angina. We've dealt with a stroke, we've dealt with some degree with kidney disease, but what for us is the number one killer in the United States of premature death is, apart from motor vehicle accidents in the young teenagers, in the teenagers, it's heart disease as a number one killer in the United States of America. I will safely say in our community it's probably less than the number one cause. It is the primary cause for premature morbidity and mortality in our younger population, not the aging American population per se. Our West Indian community, especially of Indo-Caribbean descent, has the highest incidence of coronary artery disease. And always remember this diagram. We go to our doctor, he asks us to get an EKG. The EKG can show quite a significant change. Is the EKG of that person the same as the EKG that you had maybe a week ago? There's your elderly parent or middle-aged parent with diabetes now presenting with atypical chest pain. That chest pain could be due from the fact that they always volunteer to you. It's the food that I ate last night that gave me the heartburn. But then you compare the previous EKG when the person was there and there's interval changes. You look for interval changes. Your doctor doesn't only do the EKG. He looks at any interval changes. Is there any STT wave changes to suggest ischemic changes? Is there any fast? Is the heart getting faster? Is the rate at which it, bre at it, which it beats getting faster? How does the heart rate generate? It comes from the sinoatrial nose, go by the AV bundle to the AV node, and then it travels into these branches, the right bundle and the left bundle, and that actually causes the heart to contract. This every beat from the sinoatrial node is supposed to be going to the, the AV node and then cause the heart to contract. So you get a regular P wave from the atrium contracting, QRS interval from the ventricle contracting, and T wave from the repolarization or relaxation of it. Your doctor looks at these things. Then try and figure out, is the atrium beating faster? Is every beat from the atrium that comes through does it go there? If not, what is causing it? What is the difference? What is actually resulting in it? this not happening to the patient? So your EKG is an important rudimentary tool. It is not, it is an initial event that should be, an initial test that could be done or should be done with every patient who is at risk for coronary artery disease who comes in with either a typical chest pain, mild shortness of breath, exacerbation of hypertension, fact of not feeling well, Malaise and fatigue, yes, it should be done. It's a relatively inexpensive test. It's a safe and easy test to do. By doing this, we can prevent this from occurring. If we see STT wave changes, does that patient now have another blockage of the coronary artery? Or is that blockage, which was now marginal before, become now complete, complete occlusion of the lesion? Or did that patient suffer from a cardiac event? We all like if we can maintain for the rest of our lives. And the aorta with the left anterior descending, the right coronary, looking as beautiful as this. But most of us, and I dare say in our community, in this society per se, and I say inside, in my family as well, we'll probably be expected to have this than this, especially as you approach middle age. You're gonna have narrowing of the coronary vessels, and you hope and pray it's always distal narrowing. You get proximal narrowing, we're blessed because of the fact of stenting. Stenting has done a tremendous amount to prevent us from getting open heart surgery or coronary artery bypass graft for triple, um, triple quadruple vessel disease. By stenting, what used to be done before was to put a, put a um, catheterize you from the groin or from the radial artery, 
cannulating it up to the coronary artery, infusing with dye and see where the blockage is, and then being able to dilate. Let's say that's an atheromatous plaque that we showed before. By dilating it, you can make it thinner, but even better yet, now with the drug eluting stent, you're able to cause the vessel to dilate and allow the perfusion. Now it's up to us by strict methods of diet, medication, exercising, and doing the right thing to prevent this from blocking again. There's no, there's no saying as to how soon these blockages are created. What we don't want to have, a diagnosing of angina, the typical chest pain that we presented, that basically it's all because of the fact of the decrease in blood supply to the heart. We want a statement which is a stable plaque. If that plaque ruptures, we can end up with a stroke coming from the, the blood vessels because that now becomes an embolic phenomenon. The whole goal in uh, any lectures, any talks on medicine is to make sure that there's someone out there who hearing it can make a change to their life because of the education provided. It's all for educational purposes, whether it be to Dr. Baldev's office or the other physician's office that you go to. But I'm hoping through this medium we're able to create an awareness. I can only say that I've been extremely pleased with the response that I've gotten from patients who look at the show and basically say they've gotten some important advice. I do hope that my legacy for the contribution to my community is based primarily on a single fact. If I can do this to prevent one person from dying prematurely or for one person to go without a father or a mother less than we have in this society based on education, education to do what is right because you know what was right and that rightness only came from someone taking the time off from their practice, from their schedule to try and educate you, not for the purpose of procuring another patient. I've been happy to be practicing in Richmond Hill for so many years. It's been close to 20 years. And I hope as part of my legacy to leave in my neighborhood is to create an awareness that disease processes within our community, why by and large affects the majority of the, of the American population at large, affects us in no uncertain fashion in a very unique way because of a simple fact of genetics and our environmental habits. Last week in my private practice in Richmond Hill, a middle-aged gentleman, 58 years old, walked into my practice and asked me, Doctor, I need a clearance for my surgery. My next question to him, I've seen him for the first time, is what form of surgery are you having? Oh, I'm having my prostate removed. Why are you having your prostate removed? I've got prostate cancer. We've gone through some topics before describing prostate cancer and the way it presents um, in terms of um, no, absolutely no urinary symptoms and just a, an, in, an incidental finding on doing a blood work that shows prostatic specific antigen as being elevated over 4. The normal limits we accept is 0 0.4 to 4. Anything above that is considered, anything above 4 is considered high. High index of suspicion for prostate disease, not necessarily prostate cancer, because prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate gland. And for those of us who are not familiar with the prostate gland, the prostate gland is only found in males. Definitely, it's below, it's below the bladder. It's the way the kidneys drain into the, uh, via the, into the ureters, which then drains into the bladder and then into the bladder, the urine passes through the prostatic urethra, and this is the prostate gland. That's got so much notoriety recently, and then passes out through the penis. In this gentleman's case, he had a prostate cancer. This is what a prostate gland will look normal. That's this cut in a section, an anterior posterior section, and it shows that it's normal and uniform in us when we're younger, and then tends to be increase in size and increase nodularity as we get older, presenting with symptoms of obstructive uropathy, but an inability to pass urine. In uh, our friend's case, what he did have was a prostate biopsy, a prostate biopsy through the rectum, and it turned out that he was positive for prostate cancer. I found out this subsequently from reading his documents when I first spoke to him. Um, and he was scheduled to have a total prostatectomy, removal of the prostate gland, and... Uh, 
have radiation um, afterwards. There are other procedures that could be done. There was also a lot of other stuff, what kind of cancer it was. It was an adenocarcinoma, and it's usually slayed by Gleason's, um, depending on its severity of it, and the number of biopsy specimens that come back as positive. Obviously, you know if you're doing a blind biopsy into the prostate gland from a posterior approach through the rectum, then basically you're just getting little fragments. So then you test those fragments and see how many of them are positive for cancer, and basically you, you give them a, a grading. If obviously all are positive for cancer, it makes you start to worry that the entire prostate gland is now cancerous, and now you have to look for spread for the prostate gland of cancer to have been spread to the pelvic lymph nodes, which are, um, which are inside. When I to remove this part of the abdomen, you can probably see it behind it, the posterior lymph nodes and that gives us a worse prognosis. So for all intents and purposes, we should try and diagnose prostate cancer extremely early. However, it's question to me, doctor, I need a clearance. And so I said, well, a clearance is not just a simple letter. A clearance is a letter, haven't done the procedures that says to you that you're not at increased risk for a surgical procedure. No, he said, all I need is a paper. I said, you do not need just a paper. Go to your doctor who sent you, oh, I do, all I need is just a paper saying I'm cleared for surgery. The issue here ended up with I'm saying to him that basically you do not just need a paper for surgery. You need for me to produce to the medical board and Uncle Sam to say that Mr. H, you are fit for surgery and you are at low risk for surgery or I as a physician have done everything to prevent you from having a complication or an adverse outcome due to your surgical procedure. It is not just a paper. So I told him, if you think it's just a paper, I think, my friend, here is what you should do. There are a lot of other physicians. Go and just get the paper. My case, I'm accountable and held to a higher standard to do the right thing. The right thing is to say, given the situation as it is with you, that you're in the safest possible condition to go for surgery. So he took the paper away, and he, well, he left. Obviously, in a fuss, because he said, well, all you guys want to do is to do tests to make sure that Basically, um, you make money, but I, all I want is a paper. So I said, go to any doctor who will do it for you. Oh, I don't have insurance. It doesn't matter if you're Mr. Trump with a lot of money or you're one of the patients I see on the streets who are basically homeless. You're all held to the same standard, which is doctor, do what is right for the patient. Make sure I am not, that patient is not at increased risk at the time of surgery. And what does that entail? Lo and behold, my friend came back two days later and said to me, I was right. I said, thank you very much, sir. He came with me with a list of things that the surgeon said that you need to have your primary care physician do for you. In this case, he did not have a primary care physician. He was attending a local hospital. He came to my office to say, can you now clear me for surgery? So I said, it's just writing a paper. He said, no. It includes a blood test. It includes an EKG. It includes a chest X-ray. It includes to have an echocardiogram, since he had risk factors for cardiac disease. It also includes to have a, um, um, a blood test for clotting disorders. And if anything shows up that's abnormal, he's going to need a cardiology consult for clearance. What does, that, what does all of this mean? If this gentleman needs a surgical procedure, then it's going to take him at least one and a half hours to two hours to have his total prostatectomy done, removal of his prostate. What happens for a, a clearance is the medical board asks you as a licensed physician, doctor, do what is the standard and norm of practice in the state of New York and make sure that this patient is at minimal risk for surgery at the time when the procedure is done. None of us can predict what the outcome is going to be, but at least there are certain steps and measures that every physician needs to follow, and no physician invents that for the sake of an insurance or for the patient. It is guidelines that, is spent, that, is set, that is set by by the medical state of New York and the American Medical Association in conjunction with the state of New York that this is the customary practice that we have found that decreases the incidence of any events, cardiac events, bleeding events, respiratory events. I will go into these necessary steps. So at least you are aware, in this gentleman's case, it was just prostate cancer. It was just, pro not was just, it was prostate cancer surgery that he need clearance for. But any form of surgery, colonic cancers, eye cancers, um, just any operation that's needed, you need to get a clearance. 
and I'll tell you what is involved in getting a clearance. So the next time you hear your doctor say to you, your surgeon says to you, you need to get a clearance, you have in your mind a very clear idea of what you expect it to do. As we continue our discussion in what is really clearance for surgery, and clearance for surgery is a medical term that is used very loosely. There are certain standards for doing surgical procedures. There are sur or surges, um, sur um, surgery that are considered emergencies, there are surgeons, surgeries that are considered urgencies, and there are certain surgeries that are elective. In a case of an elective surgery, in an emergency surgery, you're faced with a life, a matter of life and death outcome, and the physician is asked to make his own judgment call at that time because sometimes there's not enough time for waiting for a blood test to come, waiting for an EKG to come, a sonogram to come, a technician to come by. You have to do what is necessary in your, the best of your medical knowledge to make sure that that patient stays alive. And for emergency surgeries, depending on the degree of emergency, so if I find, for instance, in a gunshot wound and somebody's bleeding into the chest, you don't need permission to push a toracostomy tube into the chest and try and drain the blood or the air from that to, uh, in order to prevent the entire lungs from collapsing, pushing the mediastinum to one side, and then ending up with kinking of the blood vessels and uh, sudden death for a patient. In a case of a cardiac tamponade, in which you have the uh, fluid over the heart itself in the pericardial space that prevents the heart from beating, and you seeing a patient who's becoming diaphoretic, you're allowed to push a needle into that chest plate, into the chest wall, into the pericardial space and drain it, and that's a life-saving um, life procedure. In the case of a hemlich maneuver for somebody who's swallowing a foreign body, you don't need medical clearance in order to do the, for, um, the first aid measure. In the case of a bleeding within the, the brain, suspect a uh, subdural hematoma, uh, putting a borehole through the skull, through the skin, through the skull, into the area between the meninges of the brain and the, 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 the lining of the, the skull, you definitely don't need that, especially if the patient is coning, meaning the brain stem is going on, the patient's respiration is decreasing, and you have all the evidence with decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, decreased, decreased respiration, to say that the patient's respiratory and, cardi and cardiac center are being compressed when the brain stem just goes deeper into, into the, through the foramen magnum, and then that's a, that's a cause of sudden death. In a case of an elective procedure, as our previous gentleman had, this was a case in which things had to be done and had to be done correctly. On a history, his patient says he takes no medication. Yet, following the history, it came back that he had high blood pressure. At least when you measured it, it was high. He also had evidence from the history of cardiac disease, which means he had to be evaluated for cardiac disease. He was also a smoker, which meant he had to be evaluated for pulmonary disease as well. He also had a family history of one family member dying from during a surgical procedure under general anesthesia. So he had to be evaluated whether or not he had any, there's any, there's any genetic propensity for him to develop the same risk that is relative developed. So the history is extremely important. He hadn't been seen by a doctor before in the United States, but in his visits to his doctors in his home country, very little was done for him, even not even an aspirin in an elderly person, in a middle-aged person who has been smoking, who has had um, hypertension, and it shows that the level of care was not acceptable. So in the history part of it, on examination, was nothing to be found more than a, um, a five foot ten um, well-kept gentleman who basically had no evidence of, um, of wasting, no evidence of, of anemia, no evidence of any damn darkening of his sclera or jaundice, is no evidence of any um, any elevation of his um, of his of his of his blood pressure as well. His apex beat was in a normal place. His abdomen was soft. Rectal examination was even with the evidence of prostate cancer showed a marginally elevated prostate and no evidence of decreased blood flow to the periphery. So in terms of a cursory physical examination, it was okay. 
the repeat of his blood test. These are why I'm trying to tell you what are things that are needed that goes through the mind of the physician when you're trying to clear someone for surgery. So a clearance is not a useless procedure and the hospitals demand that you get cleared by primary care physicians because sometimes it, two physicians need to concur that this patient is fit for surgery. One has to be a physician outside of the hospital, one has to be a physician in the hospital. Obviously that decreases the risk factor that patient faces with an adverse outcome during the surgical procedure or even subsequent to the, surg um, the surgical procedure. The EKG for this gentleman showed evidence of STT wave changes, which was indicative of decrease in blood supply. Probably contributing to that was his hypertension, which was uncontrolled. The fact he was a smoker, which caused peripheral vascular disease. Um, also, in addition, his advancing age as well. So he had to be ruled out for evidence. His echocardi evidence of coronary artery disease. His echocardiogram was requested, and I'll continue the discussion on what was found later in him, prior to him getting to surgery, that ended up that basically would, can actually be the responsible thing that is going to save his life. Continue our discussions on clearance for surgery. We discussed the need for having a total, a complete physical examination and a blood work. The blood work in this gentleman who was being cleared for prostate surgery or any surgery in that matter, you evaluate the CBC and make sure that the strength of the blood is good enough so the gentleman or the person does not suffer from anemia and decrease oxygen car carrying capacity in the blood. It also makes sure that white blood cell count is normal so there's no evidence of infection, that the platelets are normal, there's going to be no evidence of increasing risk for bleeding. That is what the CBC is going to tell you. An ESR can probably show whether or not it's elevated that it may be an infective or inflammatory process that needs to be corrected prior to surgery. The uh, comprehensive um, metabolic profile will show that kidney functions, evaluate kidney functions, your electrolytes, especially the potassium in the blood, because potassium in itself can cause the heart to become irritable, it can cause any muscle to become irritable, especially the heart muscle, and can lead to an increased risk for having um, an arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rate and rhythm, especially for this gentleman who already had an abnormal um, EKG with STT wave changes. His potassium turned out to be normal. We also had him evaluate for his kidney function, make sure he did not have any evidence of kidney disease. His thyroid function test was interesting. It showed evidence that he had an increased level of T3, but a normal TSH level. That could be one of the contributory factors for his fast heart rate. That had to be corrected before surgery. He also could suffer because of a thyroid disease, suffer a crisis during surgery, especially no one knows what his pre-morbid condition was. He also had um, levels of blood indices for risk for clotting PTPTT. He also had his um, stool evaluated to make sure that not only prostate cancer, there was no evidence of any other lesions or the cancer did not spread to the rectum. Usually we'll have evidence of bleeding or guac or just microscopic blood or blood that's not even even seen visibly, but it's still present in the stool. Those are minimal examinations that need to be done and followed, regardless of wherever you practice. The other tests that were done for this gentleman was his echocardiogram. Because of the abnormal EKG, his advancing age, the fact that he also had an abnormal EKG, his echocardiogram show, especially with a smoke as well, that his ejection fraction was 48%, which was subnormal, and would have led to an increased risk for a cardiac event during surgery. Your ejection fractures needs to be above 60% in order for you to be able to perfuse every organ. Now you need to find out why is ejection fracture decreased, either due to a cardiac condition, either an enlarged heart, evidence of a cardiomyopathy, etc. So he was evaluated by the cardiologist. He had a stress test that was on an exercise stress test, which showed that he had a decrease, showed evidence, EKG evidence, after walking for, 40, uh, walking for five minutes on the treadmill machine that it was evidence of STT wave changes indicative of ischemic heart disease. In addition to that, his heart rate went above 180 after just five minutes of exercise, which shows that he had very poor cardiac condition, but there was also another factor that was, result that's what, that was actually causing his heart to increase, and that had to be evaluated even further. So e what I'm trying to show is that every test that was done is done for a particular reason, and the physician, even though he doesn't tell you this, is, pro is reading through all of this to make sure that your risk for having an adverse event after or during the surgery 
is decreased to the least it possibly should be under all circumstances. He had a pulmonary evaluation done to see what his, um, his peak flow rate was, and that was decreased because he'd been a smoker for almost 20-something years. And to expose that man to long periods of general anesthesia with a decreased, heart, with a decreased ejection fraction, a decreased oxygenation due to the, 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 the significant the bile, the anemia, the fact that his heart is irritable and increased heart rate just on the minimal exercise, which means it's on a minimal amount of stress, needs for further evaluation. His sonogram that was done showed that not only did he have prostate cancer, but there was metastases to the liver, which he did not say anything about. You see these, these, these nodules that appear in the liver. Your primary cancer was in the pelvis. The cancer was in the prostate itself. And he was coming, to, uh, he was coming and asking the physician to uh, give me clearance for surgery. If we did not discover that he had metastases or diffuse cancer spread to the rest of the abdomen, then and you sign off on that paper without doing a full evaluation, then you are liable as well. Because as a physician, you are held to a higher standard. If another person writes it and says you're cleared for surgery, the medical board does not deem you qualified enough to sit up. But when a physician signs off and I'm clearing you for surgery as being of minimal risk for a surgical procedure, then you're saying that I think, in my medical opinion, I think that this is the best my medical opinion, but it has to be based on firm evidence which are available in the practice in the practice in the state of New York or any part in the United States you practice. So the standards acceptable for one part of the states is accepted in all parts. But as a physician, you are held. If not, the attorney will ask you in the court, doctor, did you not see that his EKG was abnormal? Doctor, when did you evaluate his blood test? Did you not see that he was anemic? Did you not see evidence that he had an elevated T3 count that it could have caused a rapid heart rate? And do you think that was the cause of his death on the operating table? Doctor, do you think you would have approved for this patient to have a procedure, um, uh, a procedure when he already had metas a, 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 a radical prostatectomy, removal of his prostate when he already had metastases? What should be done for a gentleman like this, especially if you have an adverse account, everyone becomes an expert. All the attorneys become an expert. But as a physician, you have to held to the standard to protect your license, protect the patient's health, so that you do not have to appear before the courts. In this gentleman's case, the procedure of choice should never have been a radical prostatectomy. It should have been radiation to shrink the size of the prostate and chemotherapy. In none of those cases would you have been exposed to prolonged general surgery. Um, general anesthesia that actually could result in an adverse outcome. So what I'm alluding to, pay attention to even your doctors are instructing you what to be done. And also if you're educated in what is clearance, what is medically necessary, then you're prepared to ask the proper questions to your physician at the time you're being cleared for surgery. Having been in the practice of medicine for about 30 years, um, you develop a visual sense of acuity um, that makes things a little bit easier to see even as you get older. And uh, last week I was looking through, in, looking at my waiting room, and I noticed a gentleman was sitting on one buttocks with a wince on his face and obviously in discomfort. So sometimes you play with your mind and say, I wonder what that diagnosis is. I know he was in pain, so I called him in and I said, What's, how are you doing? Because I knew him before. He said, Doctor, I've got the worst pain in the worst area you could possibly con um, conceive. I said, yes, I know. What are some of the things then that can cause perianal pain, pain around the rectum that results in such excruciating pain? And why is it that it causes that amount of pain? A lot of us would have heard of hemorrhoids, piles, that cause extreme pain, especially when they become engorged. And if you understand the physiology of hemorrhoids or piles, and look at it, this diagram, this is really the large bowel, the sigmoid colon that ends here before the rectum starts. There's a portion of the rectum that's painless, and there's a portion that's very painful. For some reason or the other, when God made this, he made this part painful. 
So what we face with is that the, rec the, the muscles around the rectum that prevents us from passing stool when we do not want tighten up the sphincter and it's under voluntary control. This one is, has an involuntary control, but these are the venous plexuses. It's like varicose it's veins. Hemorrhoids are really veins that have become dilatated, and then when they become engorged, they prolapse through the rectum in three positions, three, seven, and 11. In this particular diagram, you can see it much clearer, where this hemorrhoid is actually bleeding around the distal end of the rectum. What happens because the area around here is so painful, it basically, anytime a rect um, hemorrhoid prolapses, and the three positions, 3, 7, 11, is when all three comes out like a cauliflower. And when you examine the patient, you usually see these big red bulbs sometimes looking at you. When they become so engorged, when every time you pass two, and not only in, in it, it happens a lot in pregnancies, the reason why it happens in pregnancies is because the, pel the, the, the fetus compresses the, uh, the, puts in additional pressure on the veins itself, decreasing the venous return from the rectal area, and those actually um, prolapse downwards. That's very, very common in pregnancy, and actually one of the treatments of, in prenatal care is to ask a woman, are you having hemorrhoids at this stage? In, us, in people who smoke chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, when you increase intrathoracic pressure, you increase intra-abdominal pressure, you push down and increase the pressure, and so does the hemorrhoids or the veins prolapse. Chronic constipation can also cause it. What decreases it is like a lot of fiber diet, lots of liquids, and basically try and prevent forcing, try and prevent chronic cough, chronic constipation. Obviously in pregnancy, we can just do little to avoid it, but just try and detect it at an early stage. What are some of the common conditions that can cause pain in that area? Not only hemorrhoids. You could also have a perianal fissure. A perianal fissure occurs in the very same area, which is extremely painful. It's like a small tear in the mucosa of the rectum. Because there are pain fibers in the mucosa of the rectum, it's extremely painful. And if hard stool passes through, it's so much more painful. In fact, patients would cry when faced with perianal fissures. Here again, the treatment is simple. If a patient comes in with pain in the rectal area associated with fever, but the pain is not really in the rectum, but in the area around the rectum, the issue rectal fossa, which are these areas here, which are like dead space around the rectal area, actually becomes infected, and it can become infected if a hair follicle is dislodged, bacteria migrates into the, into the issue rectal fossa, left untreated, you develop an issue rectal abscess. It's extremely painful, presented with fever, pulsation. If it actually is around the, peri the perineum, around the anus, it's a perianal abscess, which is not as big, and not as painful, not as a lot pus, but it's also, it's also extremely painful. But around the rectal area, issue rectal abscess, it's a lot of dead space. You can have a volume. In fact, one day I actually drained, about six or seven weeks ago, drained an issue rectal abscess, and I think I collected close to about 40 to 50 cc's of pus, frank pus coming from the issue rectal abscess from this gentleman. When you treat it, you relieve the patient of so much pain. They're, 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 they're extremely grateful, but not only that, they forget that if you do not treat it completely, at least with antibiotics, create a drainage and leave the drainage intact, you will get a recurrence of that issue rectal abscess. Going back to hemorrhoids, obviously when they present in acute condition, very painful, you can pass tool, the patient presents to the doctor. One of the first things you can do at home to decrease the size of the hemorrhoids as they prolapse is to sit in warm salt water, add about you know, t 10 to 12 teaspoons of salt in a bowl of water and sit in it for like about 10 to 20 minutes and repeating it every three to four hours. That shrinks the size of the prostate. Obviously, if in a male, you, pr you pull the testes upwards and sit in the water. You also, if it's painful, you can take an analgesic. And even ibuprofen will tend to work at that time once the size of it is shrinking. Afterwards, you can use a local analgesic, which is going to help it, like things like anusol, etc., and you place it into the rectum. But knowing fully well, these things will come right back out. So what you tend to do, the, 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 the method of treatment is to try and be sitting in warm salt water 
for as often as you can, for as long as you can, so it shrinks. You wipe off and you put the cream inside and you repeat it every three to four hours. In the case of a perianal tear or a, or, a, or a anal fissure or a tear, that has to be treated with an analgesic, a local analgesic, and treat if there's an infection. In the case of an issue rectal abscess, in the case of a perianal abscess that is excruciating pain, it's incision and drainage of the abscess, not just antibiotics alone, creating a drainage which will allow the rest of the pus to drain, or else you will get a recurrence immediately. These are three of the most common perianal conditions that we perceive in family practice that are easily treated. But the earlier it's diagnosed and the earlier it's treated, the less discomfort you will have. As recently as yesterday, I saw a patient walked into my practice in Richmond Hill. And uh, immediately I saw patients just moving away from this, uh, from this woman. This woman of dark complexion had all these white vesicles or fluid fill lesions over her entire face. And obviously was in a severe discomfort and also with fevers and chills. Um, what was surprising was not only the reaction of the persons around her, but also a little bit of the ignorance associated with this disease process. Most of us coming from the Caribbean would not have been vaccinated against chickenpox, which is the vaccination for chickenpox has only recently um, been approved for, for inoculation purposes. Um, in the Caribbean, most of us would have either not been exposed to chickenpox, and even though it's a childhood illness. And when I looked at the numbers I've seen in my practice, I, uh, and this is an anecdotal impression, is that the incidence of chickenpox is very, very low in the Caribbean. And ideally, it should be a disease of childhood, because as you get it as a child, the clinical manifestations are very few. You may end up with one or two little poxes, on the face or on the arm, a little bit of fever just for a couple of days, and you get lifelong immunity. However, when you get chickenpox as an adult, it can even be a fatal illness. Chickenpox in a person with an immunocompromised disease, whether it be from cancers or from HIV, can also be life-threatening. And the, the irony of this was that the lady who came with what, for my clinical impression, just looking at her, seemed like chickenpox, was accompanied by a woman who had had a bone marrow transplant and who was also a patient. So my immediate reaction to her was, are you still on chemotherapy for your bone marrow transplant? And then she told me, no, she's been cured for, she's been um, free of it with our Hodgkin's, Don Hodgkin's lymphoma for um, almost about three to four years. But let's go back to the disease process itself. What causes chickenpox? And when most of us can recognize that these are what the lesions look like when they start as maculopapular rashes uh, they appear, sometimes you can just, you can actually, in fact, this woman was actually seen by the emergency room and diagnosed as an allergic reaction. It's very difficult for an allergic reaction to mimic chickenpox in the latter stages. But in the early stages, it could be anything from a folliculitis, which is an infection of a hair follicle. It can also be a small form of eczema. But when you get the vesicular lesions, all of us can make the diagnosis that is due to a herpes virus. And the most common herpes virus affecting the skin, presenting in these, in these crops of macules and papules that then become vesicular, is chickenpox or um, herpes zoster. Um, in the advanced stage, as it starts to, as it starts to, 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 to get matured, they then become, loses the vesicular nature, and then they have these blackheads appearing on top of them, more necrotic than anything else. Most of us would probably recognize these as being chickenpox lesions that we commonly can see, but all of us will make the diagnosis at this advanced stage. But knowing fully well that it's not only chickenpox can present like this, other skin diseases can present like that, and we'll go into those later. What is it and how do you get chickenpox? You get chickenpox from somebody who's incubating. The incubation period is anywhere between um, 14 to 18 days. You get chickenpox from someone who has no lesions on the skin. 
It takes you from the time you get infected. And how do you get infected? You get infected from aerosol spread, meaning I've got chicken pox without any skin, skin manifestation. I am coughing and I'm spreading the virus. I'm spreading the chicken pox virus, the herpes virus, by aerosol spread. You can get it, but rarely so, from the fluid that comes from the, the, the vesicles. But more commonly, it's the aerosol spread. What happens then that I get it from the person who doesn't even have a lesion yet, because that's the incubation period it takes the virus to go from stage of inhalation of the virus. It then spreads through the lungs into the blood. When the virus replicates and form more viruses within our bloodstream, then we start to get the fevers and chill. We feel fevers, chill. It then migrates into the bone. You get bone pain. You feel the most wretched you've felt in all your life because the pains are excruciating. You've got fevers and chills. You can't do anything. Then, lo and behold, the next morning you wake up, you see lesions, these red lesions that appear in your face and sometimes in your chest wall, first of all. You see them, you start to squeeze them. As you squeeze them, those are the ones that will leave permanent marks on your face. If you leave them for 24 hours to 48 hours, you will start to see that these macular, red macules and papules become vesicular. Then they start to fill with fluid. Then your grandmother will tell you that you have chicken pox and go to the doctor. The, th the treatment at the time when you think you suspect you're exposed to someone with chicken pox or not even knowing what it is, but you have the severe fevers and chill, those are not associated with any of the other conditions, folliculitis, the eczemas that present. So you know generally that you have some herpetic infection, at least, that you should be seen for. Why is it that you should be seen early? If you start treatment with um, an antiviral treatment, you can actually prevent the number of papules that form on your skin. Because as, this, as, the, as, the, as it multiplies in the blood, the virus itself just localizes in the skin itself. In, the, in some cases, which can be fatal, the virus itself can spread to the lungs itself and even to the brain. If you, if you drink aspirin when you have in chicken pox, you can also get Rice syndrome, which can give you hepatitis, which can lead to hepatic failure. The treatment of choice, yes, you can eat and eat any meat or any fish you possibly want to eat. There's nothing that says with chicken pox you cannot eat that. Obviously, you have no appetite. All you want to do is drink. You can take any, 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 any antipyretic cream and rub it on the skin, um, Aveno baths, etc., to alleviate the itching. But anything like Benadryl or hydroxyzine will alleviate the itching. For the pains, obviously, we'll take things like Tylenol every four to six hours. And depending on the amount of lesions that appear, especially in a young adult who doesn't want to leave many scars on the face or any person at all, we can go on an antiviral medication. But the educated, education part of it is that long before you actually see the lesions, you're already spreading the disease. And to be very careful to come into contact with anyone who's immunocompromised because them, when they're getting chicken pox, can be life-threatening. In a child, it's better if they're exposed to it at that stage when you have the disease because that will prevent them from getting it as an adult. We continue the discussion to do with some of the common skin conditions that I see in my medical practice. We alluded to chicken pox. Some people think that after you have had chicken pox, then it's all gone. You will never have another episode of chicken pox unless you become immunocompromised. But what happens in quite a few cases is that the herpes zoster remains dormant in the nerves. And a lot of times you will get recurrence of or recrudescence of the virus growing within the nerve ending. And possibly the most dangerous one is to have invasion of the ophthalmic nerve. And that can actually cause blindness. You see these vesicles as they arise from the side and advance all the way towards the eye. It is extremely painful when it involves the eye, and it should be treated rapidly with antiviral medication, liberal analgesics, and the treatment has to be started early. A lot of times, I think about four months ago, I saw a patient with post-herpetic post neuralgia, extreme excruciating pain involving the thoracic cage. In fact, the herpes virus has actually invaded the nerve, the intercostal nerve, 
and actually start vesicles. But it was such a classic description of the lesion with the vesicles, the redness, the inflammation around it, that the diagnosis was very simple. But yet he had gone to three or four doctors and had actually shown the lesion to them, explaining the ex amount of pain he was having, and it was never dealt with. But these lesions need to be dealt with extremely rapidly because they advance and the more they invade the nerve, the more painful it is to the patient and the longer the duration of the illness thereof. So the, the, the herpes virus, the, the chicken pox in itself is not just an innocuous skin disease. At the time it happens, yes, but it can also give complications to involve a meningitis. It could also cause a pneumonia, which can be fatal, but it also can cause liver failure. And sub, as, a, as a sequelae of it in later years, it can also form these herpetic lesions which can recur as time goes by. So invasion of a nerve at one time can cause blindness, but then recurrence of it is the worst part to deal with. In addition to that is that exposing a person to, to a herpes, to a chicken pox, when they're immunocompromised can also be fatal, especially in HIV patients, patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma. In fact, patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which in this particular case was the patient who presented to me, was brought by a relative who had Hodgkin's lymphoma. And if the patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma gets the chickenpox infection, that could be fatal for that person. Um, HIV patients, when they actually have chickenpox infection, are treated as being very serious cases within the hospital. Leaving chickenpox behind, one of the very the one of the most common conditions I see as you walk down Liberty Avenue is especially Indian women, uh, women of um, Indian descent, um, having from the Caribbean islands or elsewhere, having this mask-like brownness or discoloration around the face, which is called melasma. It sometimes it looks makes the face looks dark but it also makes them feel very, very, very aware of what they have on their face. And it's something that's easily treated. But one of the biggest misnomer about the, the misunderstanding about it is that exposure to sun does not cause exacerbation. Yes, it does. It increases the sensitivity, hypersensitivity of that area that's affected. In fact, this is how melasma will present um, with the darkening of the face. In a, in a Caucasian person, in our people, it presents with the same darkening over, this, over the face itself, but it gives a mask-like appearance. Here, we should be using things like sunblocks, and bleaching creams will get rid of it, at least temporary, or decrease the discolorations, because when it occurs in a fair person, the darkness is extremely prominent, and I've known women in my practice who are extremely... Um, sensitive about the facial appearance, especially with melasma. It is not indicative of any underlying disease. Compare this, however, with something called discoid lupus, much more common in the, in the Afro-Caribbean population that's associated with systemic lupus erythematosus. You have this butterfly re le um, lesion that is hypersensitive. When you go into the sun, it, has a, it looks like a butterfly over the face, all right? But it's, very, it's a very sinister disease. Systemic lupoi is associated with multi-systemic organ failures. It can cause, from a head-to-toe approach, it can cause alopecia losing hair. It can cause lesions within the mouth. It can result in generalized aches and pains. It can cause a pneumonitis. It can also cause, but the most important problem that it causes is premature renal failure. The discoloration of the face might be the reason why the patient comes to the doctor and present with a butterfly rash in the face and saying it gets worse in sunlight. If you question them even further, you may find out that they have also, in addition to that, generalized aches and pains. But to your surprise, when you do a kidney test on them, just a simple blood test for the kidneys, you might find evidence of early kidney disease. Systemic lupus erythematosus even an, um, considered, is not considered a common disease over here. In the Caribbean, in our Afro-Caribbean population, 
it is a very common disease. And the basic thing about it, there's no cure for systemic lupus. But you can treat the symptoms early. You can address the issue early with the patient so they can monitor especially the kidney function. You can also have the cardiopulmonary system evaluated. Because systemic lupus can actually cause death if left untreated. But the morbidity associated with the multisystemic disorder can result in a lifestyle that is less than accommodating. Our discussion today will center around allergies, allergic reaction, sinusitis, and bronchitis. Lots of times patients confuse the words allergies and I'm allergic to. At all times we should be extremely clear especially if you're allergic to a particular medication, especially penicillin. Because a lot of times these medications can be given in the emergency room and uh, sometimes in a comatose state, if it's given to you, especially if you're allergic to it, can result in death itself. It's very simple for us to just be aware of it, but it's always nice to have a bracelet that says, I'm allergic to whatever it is, because that's one of the first places we will check in the case of an emergency. An allergic reaction is life-threatening, but the most common presentation of allergic reaction, as we all know, is this macular and macular papula rash that appears on the skin like wheels all over that tend to itch, and uh, we scratch them to get rid of the irritation they produce, and we all can get generalized itching all over, even get Nikolsky phenomena, you scratch and you see your wheels appear over the ear you scratch. But the skin manifestation itself is easily treated, and usually something like Benadryl or hydroxycine will get rid of it, but you need to find out what you're allergic to. Could it be something that you rubbed on your skin, or could it be something that you've eaten, or you've ingested in some other form? Those are the two most common methods of getting an allergic reaction. But your cells, um, your cells regard that whatever it is that you are exposed to, whether it's from the surface of the skin or ingested and into the bloodstream and then went to the skin as being something that you cannot take. And the mast cells are the ones that produce this fluid and the irritation around the skin. But what it does to the lungs itself is cause the same mucosal swelling that can result in asphyxia. You will not be able to breathe. And a lot of deaths have been associated with the use of penicillin in the past when epinephrine was not given at that time as a life-saving procedure that basically people will die from asphyxia not because the airways, the airways themselves just clamp, clamp down and you're unable to get air into the lungs. So it's extremely important that anything you're allergic to, you tell your doctor about it, but the rest of the family should be made aware. And so you should also have a bracelet that says to the public, that you're allergic to X, Y, and Z. Allergies, on the other hand, is what we all develop at this time of the year. And sometimes a lot of physicians, thank God for allergies um, season, so they can see patients in their practice. Our practice has been inundated with patients with allergies. And allergies in themselves, commonly we refer to as basically having the itchy eyes, the running nose, the post-nasal drip, the repetitive coughing. Itself. And all of us are aware what are some of the common complications of having allergies. Because allergies themselves affect the skin, but also affect um, allergies can itself be any way to do with skin manifestation to things like atopic eczema, to anything to do with sinusitis, uh, bronchiolitis, and uh, the symptoms that produce primarily that brings them to the, bring the patient to the physician. Doctor, I've got the worst headaches. It's Persistent headaches associated with fevers. I can't even concentrate. My head feels so heavy. Now, if you look at the anatomy of, of, the, of, the, of the sinuses, then you'll understand why. The sinuses also have the same pseudostratified columnar epithelium that the lungs has, and the same amount of mucosal edema that tends to happen when we're having infections within the lungs tends to happen here as well. These are the frontal sinuses. These are the ethmoidal cells. These are the maxillary sinus. When you're getting frontal sinus infection, you feel the head feels so heavy. 
that you cannot focus. You cannot focus on your computer screen. You cannot focus, you cannot keep your head upright without feeling excruciate amount of discomfort. It can be associated with fever and sometimes even photophobia, not being able to look into light. When the maxillary sinuses are infected, the face feels heavy. You can also see a puffiness around the jaws themselves. The patient also with a, with, a sinus, with a maxillary sinus infection because of the proximity of where the maxillary sinus drains into the middle ear can also present with an otitis an ear infection. But more often than not, that patient will come presenting with a fullness in the ear and not being able to hear properly. But it's not as if it's a total deafness. It's almost as if when you're landing in an aircraft, that fullness that we experience in the ear canal itself. That infection can also spread to the middle ear, as I said. If it occurs in the sphenoidal sinus, which is not as common, then you basically will have a headaches within the head itself. And patients would usually say, doctor, the headache is way inside of the head itself. When we look at the same process that causes the infection within the sinuses, remember the same pseudostratified epithelium is there is also an inside of the nose. So if we look at this as a transverse section through the face, in which we're looking at one side of the nasal septum. You're looking at these ethmoidal cells that are filled with fluid that you cause the congestion. And because one of the, one of the sinuses drain through here, when these cells become enlarged, they become edematous, they become bulbous, and you can actually look into your nostrils and see these almost polyp-like material coming, by, coming down. That in itself produces stuffiness in the nose and also make the sinus infection worse. In the case of a non, an acute sinusitis, which presents without any fever, but just with the symptoms of the, the stuffiness or the drainage of that particular area, simple things like um, Allegra Claritin, um, antihistamines can also help tremendously with the symptoms. When the patient starts to develop fever, with it and worsening of or swelling of the face and severe discomfort, then it possibly have changed from a bacterial infection to, um, to from a viral infection to a bacterial infection. In the next topic, we'll try and differentiate when it's acute and chronic and when it is needs to be treated more vigorously and also its relationship to bronchitis and uh, viral bronchitis and also bacterial bronchitis. As we continue our discussion on allergies, sinusitis, and bronchitis, and the relationship thereof, we look at these diagrams and figure out exactly what the relationship is with the entire respiratory epithelium. If you look at the lungs themselves and the bronchioles through which we breathe, and then the bronchus itself, they all have the same respiratory epithelium. And in a case of sinusitis, because of the fact of where the sinuses are located, the frontal sinus on this part of the head, maxillary sinus here, the ethmoidal here cells, the, the adenoids within the back of the throat, but then these conches, um, the, inferior, so the, inferior, the superior, inferior, and middle conche. We also notice that inside the respiratory tract, the trachea, the bronchus, the bronchioles are all lined by the same respiratory epithelium. So whether or not we get a bronchiolitis to start with that actually spreads and cause a, a sinusitis or we get them simultaneously and they spread, they present through the same symptoms. The most common presentation that I see in my practice is the patient comes with a doctor, I've got the cough, cold, fever, chills. And basically I've been having this for at least about a week. Usually it's associated with headaches, dizziness, I'm unable to concentrate, I keep coughing all hours at nights, and my wife says that it prevents her from sleeping, or my husband says it prevents me from sleeping, so I've come to you. I do not think that you need to wait until your spouse tells you that that's preventing them from sleeping. Because the earlier you treat these, these allergy symptoms, the earlier you will prevent the infection of the sinuses and the lungs. When you understand that exposure to allergens will cause mucosal edema and cause the running nose, the itchy eyes, the same phenomena is taking place within the skull where we have this, these spaces. This is the space because that prevents the head from becoming too heavy for us to carry. But the, 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 the disadvantage of that is that basically they create within the head 
these respiratory epithelium that becomes infected the same way. So when the frontal sinus are infected, the headaches and dizziness, and we think that it's coming to the end of the world. But basically, they're treated very early. Whichever one, whether it be the frontal sinus infected, the maxillary sinus, the ethmoidal sinus, the sphenoidal sinus, whether it be within the itchy eyes, the running nose itself, you can prevent that infection from spreading from the nostril with the itchy eyes and running nose to the ears that becomes infection to the frontal sinuses because they're all connected through the drainage of it into this area, as we can commonly see here. They all end up draining here. But the one that presents with patients coming into the office wheezing and unable to breathe, and they complain as if they're stifling, is when it's left untreated for a while. And look at what happens in the case of a normal bronchus and a bronchus that's affected. In this case, let's look at the respiratory tract. You have the trachea, you have the bronchus, the trachea that comes here, the main stem, you have the main stem bronchus here, and then you have the bronchioles, which are smaller parts of it. Now, just look at when it becomes infected. There is fluid that actually accumulates because of the, the cell, the respiratory epithelium from the mass, secretes the fluid. When that fluid is secreted, it occludes the lumen. So look at what is happening here. The fluid as itself, this is a normal what it looks like. This is the respiratory epithelium. This is the, the musculature around it, and these are the glandular cells, the mucous glands around it, that secretes the mucosal um, fluid. Now, in a case of an infected uh, bronchiole, let's take this, for instance, that's now infected. Now, look at, the, look at the caliber of the lumen. Compare with this, compare with this. So very little air is getting into the lungs, so you start to feel as if I'm not, you start to experience air hunger. You're unable to get enough air into the lungs itself, and that is due to the one, the mucosal edema, the amount of mucosa or fluid being secreted, mucosal fluid secreted into the lumen. You also have evidence of mucosal edema, but you also have inflammatory infiltrates into the mucous lining. Also, the musculature itself becomes tighter than usual. Now, in order to reverse this, it takes time. When it should have been treated, it before it reached this advanced stage. So at all times when you start to experience a difficulty in breathing and you think it's just the allergies, know fully well that exposure to the allergens will cause muco mucus, muco um, mucus fluid within the areas, increasing mucosal edema and difficulty breathing. However, the secretions within the lungs if they get infected with bacteria, can then become a bronchitis. And from a bronchitis, you can go to um, a bronchopneumonia, which is still treatable as an outpatient, and that can advance to a lobar pneumonia, which only has to be treated in a hospital and can also be life-threatening. So what is the important lesson to learn? Is that the minute you start to experience the itchy eyes, the nostrils draining, the headaches, at least see a doctor to at least make sure you get some form of treatment. And if that treatment is not effective and you start to have fever and chills, it's an indication that you should be evaluated again and at least be considered for antibiotics. These in themselves are simple things in medicine, but it can become very complicated, resulting in infection spreading within families, resulting in loss of time from school, loss of time from work, and also prevent us from being very productive at what we're doing.